Are you disconnected, estranged, alienated, or possibly erased from your kids or grandkids' lives, maybe some other family members? Do you find yourself struggling to stay present with yourself and others? Are you getting really negative responses to your texts, emails, or possibly even your in-person conversations? Do you feel that some days are just too hard and you just don't know how you're going to get to the end of the day? Does it feel like 10 minutes takes an hour? Well, that was all true for me. It was really hard and the days were long and I didn't know what to do. I felt hopeless, isolated, lonely, confused, and and really desperate to be quite honest. So today, I'm going to introduce you to some tools that I use every single day in my life. They save me over and over again. And the nice thing about these tools is you can start to implement them today. They're not easy. They take work and you master them slowly a little bit by little bit, but they are definitely useful to interrupt the ruminating thoughts, some of your interactions. They give you a place where you can embody what's happening instead of just coming from a reactive, reactionary place. So stay tuned, and we will get right into it. In the early days of being alienated from my daughters, I was paralyzed. I couldn't work anything that created any kind of anxiety or even complication I stayed away from. I was completely scared of the mail. And to be perfectly honest, I'm still scared of the mail. I have a hard time going down to the mailbox. I'm always expecting something just to pop up. That is definitely a work in progress, and I think you can relate to that. My nervous system was on complete crazy. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to regulate myself. I didn't even know what the word regulate meant. And regulate means just to get your body into a place of like neutrality where you're able to move through the day, where you're able to interact with people, where you're able to actually show up instead of hiding out in your room or not going to social events or not going to work. So regulation is a really important part of dealing with alienation and estrangement and disconnection and all that stuff. So today we're going to talk about NVC, which is nonviolent communication. It's an empathetic form of communication. So all those emails and texts and conversations you're having that don't seem to go right, I'm going to give you a framework so you will better understand what is actually happening in the conversations and texts and emails. You will be able to communicate from a place of empathy, which will shift a lot of the relationships and a lot of the interactions that you're having. We're also going to talk about meditation, how to calm your body, how to get back into your body, how to get out of those ruminating thoughts. Then we're going to talk a little bit about breath work. And somatic therapy is really just getting into your body. It's getting out of your mind and out of the narrative and out of the ruminating thoughts. And it's actually getting into your body so you can actually address some of the older trauma or maybe some of the unresolved wounds that you're carrying around with you. We will also talk briefly about a couple trainings that are going to be coming up. One of them is called the GRACE training, which was developed by Roshi Joe and Halifax at uh, the Upaya Zen Center in New Mexico. And it's a great way to resource yourself, and it just takes a couple minutes. So I'll share briefly about that. And we'll also talk very briefly about Byron Katie, who does something called The Work, a wonderful, useful tool to take some of these limiting thoughts and beliefs and kind of looking at them through different angles and different lenses. And again, as we transform some of these ideas and these thoughts, hey, my daughter hates me, this person doesn't like me, my son called me the devil, whatever it was we get to get some relief and we get to get some perspective and we get to see some other things that are happening too. So stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting show. So at the beginning of my podcast, I like to identify. And identifying is just letting you know where I am on my journey and what my relationships look like with my kids. And this is what we do at support group meetings too. So my name is Lawrence. I qualify as an alienated father. I have three daughters. I have a 28-year-old daughter that I haven't had any connection with for seven years. I have a 25-year-old daughter that we had about three or four years of no connection and we're just starting to explore what connection looks like. And I have a 21-year-old daughter that I have regular contact with. I'm also a grandfather and I'm yet to meet my grandkids. I want to be clear that when I identify as an alienated father, I'm not saying that my daughters are doing anything to me. 
It's just how I show up in meetings. And I think it's important for our community that I let you know where I am so you can relate to what I'm going through and some of the information I'm sharing. You can see how it will relate directly to your life. So in the beginning, I was really angry at my kids. I thought they were doing something to me. And if we would have been having this conversation six years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, I would have told you that they're treating me badly. But that's just not the case. They're just trying to survive. They're just trying to get through life with some of the coping mechanisms and strategies they learned from me and my ex-wife. And they've learned a plethora of other stuff in their life that hopefully puts them in a better position than I ever was. For anyone new to the struggle, you know, struggling with parental alienation, estrangement, just disconnection from your family, whatever it is that you're dealing with, it might seem daunting when you hear people talking about how long they haven't had any kind of contact with their kids. The point of this podcast is that you don't have to make the same mistakes that we've made. You can interrupt the system in different ways. And as you're working on yourself, you can transform the responses. And by mitigating some of your own behaviors, you won't go down the same rabbit hole. So this is basically like an intervention. Here's a way for you to change the direction of your life and potentially your kids' and grandkids' lives. So even though it sounds scary, you know, I encourage you to stay for the journey. And especially the next episode, you're going to hear a a couple parents talk about what their relationships look like with their kids, how they're transforming, and one person has the child back in their life and the other person's still working on that. And it's just some great perspective taken and you can hear all the different ways that they're recovering themselves. So the first thing I am going to talk about is going to be support groups. So I have been involved in support groups for 30 some odd years now and they have been transformational. So why a support group, you ask? So for me, it's really important to be around a community of people that are struggling with the same thing. I don't know about you, but for me, there's so many people in my life that I try to describe what's happening with my kids and what my struggles are, and they automatically think that something happened, there was some kind of trauma, I did something wrong. So there's kind of like this big vortex and space where I can't necessarily connect with people or get any kind of support. So the neat thing about the support group, like I was saying, is there's a bunch of people that are struggling with the same thing, and everyone's kind of rowing in the same direction. We all have the same definitions the same vocabulary, so I don't have to stop and explain what's happening. People can automatically relate. And what this does for me, it really relieves a lot of anxiety. It also gives me people to talk to, people to hang out with, people to kind of like trudge the road with. So as I'm going through my ups and downs, there's other people that can support me. And at times, there's other people that I can support. And there's also a plethora of tribal knowledge. And what tribal knowledge is, is There's a lot of people that have gone through a lot of different things at different times in their lives, and they have information on how they got through stuff or how they messed stuff up. And in a community, we get to share that together in a constructive way. So the newcomer or the next person in doesn't necessarily have to go through the same thing that we went through, right? So it's just like going to class where you're learning something, you're learning the ABCs, the ABCs of coping with whatever's happening in your life. And by learning the ABCs, you don't have to misspell a bunch of words. So I belong to an incredibly robust community of of parents and grandparents and other estranged folks, and we support each other along the path. And the really important thing here is the framework that we're working with has been in existence for 75 years. It's based on the Al-Anon family groups, and we use the Al-Anon literature, and it's an incredibly powerful place. And there's folks all over the the bell curve. There's some people that have no connection with their kids. There's some people that are reconnecting with their kids. There's some people that have full connection with their kids. There's some people that have partial connection with a kid or no kid or grandkid or no grandkid. So people are all over the spectrum. So if you happen to be struggling with this stuff, I would suggest attending a support group. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes so you'll be able to access that straight away. You'll be able to read about what these groups are and aren't and decide if they for you. As I've said before on, on other episodes, these groups are about recovery. They're about recovering an emotional and spiritual relationship with yourself. And from that place, going out and, and reestablishing relationships with other people in our lives. And if you're curious how this manifests in other regular parents' lives, make sure you're checking out the next episode because we'll have a panel of some parents that are actually going through the process and they'll share what their experience has been like, what it was like, and and where they are now. You definitely don't want to miss that. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is NVC, which is nonviolent communication. 
And this has changed every single relationship in my life. You know, I'm going to repeat that. This has changed every single relationship in my life. I really thought that I was a great communicator. I thought I was honest and direct, and I thought that I was useful. And sometimes it is. This isn't saying that I'm bad or defective or wrong. This is just giving me, again, a new framework to work with so I can communicate and connect with people in a different way. And this has been transformational with my daughters, with my parents, with my ex-wife, and with all my friends. So NVC is an empathetic form of communication. And it's really about trying to figure out what the other person is needing and feeling, and then if there's an appropriate reaction. So as you can see, like NVC is really about reflecting what the other person's feeling and needing. It's not about you. So it's really important. Can I detach? Can I put down the label of father, brother, mother, sister, whatever it is, and can I just think what the other person is feeling and needing? And the neat thing about this is from that place of just thinking about what the other person is feeling and needing, I can create attunement to them. And attunement is that place where you're in a conversation for someone and you feel each other and you feel like they're present and you make eye contact and you feel like there's kind of like a gel, right? So what MVC does is it gives you that gel that kind of connects two people together. And I know for me, in most conversations, the most important thing for me is I want to be seen and heard. I want people to understand me. I don't want people to fix me or tell me what to do. And neither do our kids, neither do our grandkids, neither does anyone else in our life. You know, so NBC gives you something to work with that will transform every relationship. And it also asks for consent. Like before I give my opinion or offer something to someone, I'm like, do you just want me to listen? Are you curious for some feedback? We're going to have a, a great interview in two or three shows with a NVC professional, and, and we're going to get into some of the nuances, how this works, what your next steps are, how you can incorporate NVC into your life straight away. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to give you a couple printouts and PDFs that you can use immediately, and also some direction, what you can do right after the show to go out and practice this. And again, this is one of the most important tools that I use on a daily basis with every single relationship that I have. So meditation is phenomenal. I love it. It's a huge part of my life. And the word meditation feels really off-putting or confusing or scary to some people. Maybe it's something that you've never practiced or tried before. And the really basic form of meditation is just concentration. And the easiest form of concentration that I know of is just to concentrate on the breath. So when I'm doing meditation work, I'm just concentrating on my breath. I'm concentrating on the breath coming in through my nose. And then I'm concentrating on the breath going out through my nose. I'm feeling the sensation of the breath coming in. And I'm feeling the sensation of the breath coming out. And for me, my thoughts come in there and I get wrapped up in a story or I get lost in a list or maybe my dog starts to bark and I get a little distracted. And, and then when I notice that, I just come right back to the breath and I concentrate on breathing in through the nose and breathing out through the nose. I set a timer, whether it's for five minutes or 10 minutes. There's some great uh, apps out there. Insight Timer is free and it's the one that I use and there's a bunch of great meditations on there. So concentration meditation we spoke about, fantastic, great way to get into your body, great way just to relax, great way to get underneath the thoughts. And for me, because I've been practicing for a while, like when I sit down, my body relaxes really quickly. I get underneath those limiting thoughts and those stuck places and those resentments and the fear and and I get into my body and I'm able to work with all different kinds of emotions. And the neat thing about meditation is you're cultivating space in meditation while you're sitting on the cushion, sitting on the chair, whatever it is. And by cultivating the space and this clarity and this, this quiet, when I go out into the world, I'm not as reactive. I'm calmer. I don't have to snap. And when I don't meditate, I go into situations and I blow stuff up sometimes and I'm not as calm. I'm not as composed, right? So we spoke about concentration meditation. If that doesn't feel like your thing and you, you like being outdoors, there's walking meditation. And a really simple form of walking meditation that I do is you're just, it's probably like taking like 10 steps, but each step you're doing incredibly slowly and you're feeling your foot touch the ground every single place from your heel to your pads, to your toes, to your knee bending. And then you take your next step and you're really just concentrating on every body part moving slowly. 
right? And just another form of concentration. After you've taken your 10 steps, you turn around, you, f- you feel your hips rotating, moving, and then you just take 10 steps in the other direction. And again, five minutes, 10 minutes, 25 minutes, whatever it is that feels useful to you. And I know for me, like I have a lot of physical pain. So walking meditation was incredibly important on my journey when I was in some physical pain and just couldn't sit or didn't have the ability to be still. Walking meditation saved my life. And we will be doing a, a, a show on, on just meditation and we'll give you seven or eight different practices and different ideas that you can use. And if you want, there's going to be a link in the show note. Click on that and we're going to have a meditation groups. So we're going to have some free meditation tapings, letting you know how to meditate and some different works. In the show notes, there's going to be a link to sign up for some of the new meditation question and answers, some of the trainings, and also working with meditation in direct relation to alienation, estrangement, disconnection, and erasure. So there's going to be wonderful stuff there for you to click on and something you can use straight away. So definitely check that out in the show notes. So next I'm going to talk about somatic therapy and breath work. And if you're not familiar with the word somatic therapy, somatic therapy is really about getting into your body. And the idea is, is, is usually when we go into therapy, we're stuck up in our head and we're talking about what's happening, what the story is, what the narrative is. And, and you might find this familiar, like you go to your therapist and you keep talking about the same thing over and over again, or a new iteration of the same thing. And it kind of feels like you're just spinning your wheels. Well, what somatic therapy does is it gets you underneath those noises, underneath those voices, underneath that story, and it actually gets you into your body, it gets you into the trauma, and you can actually start to resolve stuff. So for me, I did regular therapy from was probably about 20, 25 years, and the last 10 or 12 years, I've done somatic therapy. And I've done something called IBP, which is Integrative Body Psychotherapy, and it's, it's a wonderful framework. Within the framework, Breath is used very, very often. And what breath does is it gets some energy flowing through your body. It gets you into your body. And as you breathe and get out of your head and get into your body, into your heart, into wherever the energy is moving, you start to get below the story. And once you start to get below the story, you start to get into the emotions. And once you start getting into the emotions, then you can start to process stuff and release stuff. And I found out some phenomenal things about my family, about my family of origin, about my behaviors and how my behaviors have affected my kids in a really negative way. And this is really, really integral, important work because the more I learn about myself, the more I'll learn about how I show up in every situation, the more I can show up as an integrative person, as a spiritually and emotionally available person. And somatic therapy gives me a great way to access parts of myself that I haven't accessed in the past. Like I started somatic therapy at 36 years old, maybe 38 years old. So for my first 38 years, I was just getting by. I was just doing what needed to get done until my life fell apart and I got in enough pain that I was ready to do something else. And there's another form of breath work I just want to throw in there with the somatic stuff and it's called holotropic breathing. You can Google it. There's a bunch of different videos out there. You can follow some different stuff. And again, it gets you into your body. It gets energy running through your body. It's a way to tap into your emotions. And it's also a great way to build some resiliency in you. So when you're in a high pressured situation or in some conflict or something, if you're building resiliency through the breath work and your body's able to hold more and more energy, then you kind of increase your speed limit. And what one of my teachers taught me about the speed limit is it's an emotional speed limit. It could be a spiritual speed limit. And sometimes I'm having a conversation with my mother, let's say, and we're talking about something and something she says feels overwhelming to me. Well, if my speed limit's very low, at a certain point in the conversation, I cut off and I kind of go away and I can't tolerate anything more that's going on. So as I do somatic therapy, as I do breath work, I start to have more resiliency. My speed limit goes up. I have more tolerance for conversations. And having tolerance for a conversation might be just me excusing myself from a conversation. It might just me being present enough to say, hey, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. I need to take a little bit of time away from myself. But I will check back with you in five minutes, 10 minutes, tomorrow, whatever the next day is. And again, we're going to have a phenomenal somatic therapist come on here. Her name is Dr. Mandy. She's going to be talking about the healing framework. That's going to be in two episodes. And this stuff is really transformational and stuff that you can take with you straight away 
and start to implement into your daily life. We're now going to talk about some resiliency training that's a little bit different. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is grace training. And grace training was developed by Roshi Joan Halifax at Yopaya Zen Center in New Mexico. And if you go onto their website, you can actually listen to some of the grace trainings. And I've taken several of these and, and they're fantastic. So grace is an acronym, G-R-A-C-E. And what this is used for, this is used for if you're in some kind of situation where you're feeling again, scared, anxious, confused, don't know what to do, and you need to kind of recalibrate yourself, right? So maybe you excuse yourself from a room, maybe you pull the car over, just take some breaths. And what this training was originally for was for like nurses in the ER. And as they were going outside from patient to patient, this training was used for them to actually get back into their body, to ground themselves so they could go into the next conversation. They could go into the next room. And now it's adapted for pretty much any situation that feels overwhelming, traumatic, or anything like that. And it's something perfect to use for parents or grandparents that are struggling with any form of estrangement or alienation erasure, whatever word you want to use. So the G in grace is for grounding. How do I get back into my body? How do I feel my feet? Right? Have I cut off? Have I left the conversation? Am I not really aware of what's going on? Am I just being reactive? If any of those things are happening, you know that you're not grounded and you're not in your body. So you take a time out, you walk away, you pull over your car, you figure out what's a safe and appropriate way for you to take a little bit of space. And for me, I'll just say, hey, I need to take a little bit of space. I'm feeling anxious. I just want to check in with myself. I'll be back. It can be as simple as that. It doesn't need to be complicated and you don't need anyone's permission to take care of yourself. It's really important and it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Take care of yourself because if you're taking care of yourself then you're taking care of the people around you, you're taking care of the conversations around you. So grace, G again, grounding. R is recall. You want to recall why you're there. Like what's going on? What, what's your intention? Is your intention to have a nice, loving conversation? Is your intention to be present? Is your intention not to give advice? Like what's your intention? So again, the R is for recall. And then the A is for attune. So attunement is just being really at home with yourself, being really present with yourself. So when I'm attuning to myself, my feet are on the ground. I'm aware of my breath. I'm present. I can see the different colors around me. If I happen to be eating something, I'm actually tasting the food and chewing and not just guzzling stuff down. So that's attuning to myself. And once I've attuned to myself, then I'm going to attune to others. I'm going to be able to look them in the eyes. I'm going to be able to listen to what they're saying. I'm not going to be reactive. I'm not going to be caught up in a, a trauma or a secondary trauma response. So I'm attuning to myself and then I'm attuning to others. And then the seeing grace is consider. Consider what the next appropriate action is. Is the next appropriate action for me to use NVC and say, wow, that sounds really hard. It sounds like a really challenging situation that you're in. Is the next thing to consider whether I leave the conversation that it's not feeling good and I excuse myself and say, hey, I, I, got, a day. I got to go. So the C in grace is consider. And then the E in grace is to engage. So do I engage? Do I give someone a hug? Do I continue the conversation? Do I ask if the other person feels heard or if there's anything that I missed? Do I clean something up? Maybe I got reactive and I engage and say, wow, that must have really hurt your feelings. I'm sorry. Huh? Yeah, that's a, that's a really crappy way for me to treat you. And that might be engage and engage can actually be end as well, which is kind of like the wrap up to what's going on. So with the grace training, we're going to have someone phenomenal on the show that will take us through the process and maybe we'll be working directly with a, another parent or maybe I will just be that step in surrogate that can go through one of the trainings so you can see how that works and then apply it to your own life. And the last resiliency practice that I'm going to talk about is something called the work. And this framework was created by Byron Katie. And what the framework does is it takes some limiting beliefs and ideas and it kind of like spins them around so you get to look at different perspectives and different ways to heal some of these thoughts. And a limiting thought might be, my child hates me, right? And how do I work with that? Because that, that's a traumatic thing to go through. So Byron Katie's framework asks four important questions and a turnaround process. And this is basically how that would sound if I'm working with my child hates me. 
The first question you would ask yourself is, is it true? So does my child hate me? Is that true? And possibly you could answer yes to the question, right? And, and that could be your projection, your perception. It could be true. It could feel true to you. And then you'll go to the second question. And the second question is, can you absolutely know it's true? So can I absolutely know it's true that my child hates me? I can't say that I can. I know my child's struggling and going through all different kinds of changes and they're just trying to survive. So can I absolutely know that it's true that my child hates me? No, I can't. And the third question is, what happens when I believe that thought to be true? So the thought that my child hates me, what happens when I believe that to be true? You could notice all ranges of emotions, fear, sadness, anger, anxiety, and a plethora of other emotions. And you might even notice yourself withdrawing, shutting down, becoming less emotionally available to your child because you're just trying to take care of yourself and you're believing that thought so it's really limiting what your actual connection is with your child. So you can see it's kind of like a self-defeating prophecy. And the fourth question is, who would I be without that thought? So can you imagine if I was without the thought that my child hates me, if I didn't believe that in like this really strong, solid way, but I could actually look that my child is struggling and just trying to get through, and then I see like I'm shutting down because I'm struggling with their behavior, so I'm not really showing up fully as a parent, and that's causing all other kinds of reactions and interactions. Right? Can I hold the situation with curiosity? Can I hold the situation? No, no, that's not necessarily true. And can I see what happens next? And then the final step is the turnaround. The turnaround to my child hates me would be, I hate my child or my child doesn't hate me. Basically the opposite of what you're saying. And by working with these turnarounds, you get to see other perspectives and maybe this really solid idea that you had that your child hates you is not true. It's not the only thing that is happening. And as you work with these different emotions in your body and stuff, some of these absolute rigid thoughts start to dissolve. And then you feel your nervous system start to relax. And it's a great way to work with the nervous system. It's a great way to work with a lot of these traumatic interactions with the kids and, and just processing what's actually going on for them. And we're going to get into this in a, in a following show where we're actually going to spend time and go really slowly through this so you can actually do a takeaway and practice some of these things yourself. I'm just trying to give you like a really brief introduction. And this is setting the table for all the other shows that are coming up because we're going to be talking about all these different things over and over and over again. And the neat thing about our program is everything's free, right? All the 12 step meetings are free. The support group meetings are free. All these different um, tools that I'm talking about are all going to be offered free. We're a nonprofit. So we're really here just to help and support the community. So we've covered a lot today and I've covered stuff in a general way. And each one of these will get covered thoroughly in a following episode. And if you're a parent or a grandparent or another family member like me, and again, if you're struggling and don't know what to do and you think it's hopeless, I'm giving you some great tools. The support group, you can jump on anytime you want if that feels like something you want to explore. There'll be a link in the show notes. NVC, there's going to be some great worksheets at the, at the end of this podcast that you can download straight away. And you can actually take those with you anywhere you go and you can start to practice that. You can look at emails or texts that you've received in the past and you can see, huh, maybe I could have responded differently. Maybe it would have sounded this way or sounded that way. And you practice it with low threshold interactions. You don't need to practice it in the most volatile situations at first. So if I was going to say the most important one thing to take away from today's episode is resource yourself reach out to community, get involved in a support group, look at different ways to communicate. Find out about meditation, look into somatic therapy, just resource yourself. And as you build resources, you will start to build resiliency. And all it is, is adding a bunch of different tools to your tool belt. They will be accessible and you'll have knowledge of how they work and how they can be an intervention into something you might be stuck with or a place of just extreme pain or sadness, isolation. So yeah, a lot to work with there. Please, please try them out. The next episode is going to be fantastic. We're going to have a couple parents on a panel and they're going to let you know how all these different tools are working in their life. You know, you don't need to listen to me. You can actually hear different people, their lives, experiences, where they were before they started using these tools and before they started attending the, the PA support groups. 
what tools they've learned, how they apply to their lives, how it works when they're working with different emotions around the kids or in relationship with their kids, what has changed, where their life is going, and they will share their best takeaways. The experiences that they share will help shape your path going forward, whether you're a fully alienated or estranged parent, whether you have partial contact, whether you have full contact. And maybe full contact might be the most complicated because it's something that you have to work with on a daily basis. So for me in my early days, I was really trying to be a good person. I was trying to do the next right thing. I had the best intentions. I I really thought that I was communicating with my kids in a useful way, that I was communicating with my parents and everyone else in my life in a useful way. You know, I had that intention. I really, really, really thought that I was a good guy. And the thing about intentions is that's great. But what everyone was looking at was my actions. And my actions and my intentions didn't necessarily line up. And the reason they didn't necessarily line up is because there was an impact zone. There was an impact zone on my intentions and how I was communicating and what I was trying to do. And sometimes I was just trying to get needs met for myself because I felt so anxious. I was just trying to get other people to help soothe me. Or maybe I was going into a conversation trying to convince someone to do something different. And none of that was really useful because I wasn't embodied. I wasn't attuned to myself. I wasn't present. These tools have changed my life. I go into most interactions grounded, present, available. And once in a while, I, I, I do lose it. Like this isn't anything that's a perfect science. This is a practice. Just like going to school or working at a new job, you practice it and different skills get developed as you go along. And some days are really good days and some days aren't. So I told you I was going to give you something that you can work with today. So in the show notes is a link to an NVC needs and feelings list. And the needs and feelings list just help you identify what the other person might be feeling or might be needing. And what you can do with this is you can talk to a friend, your partner, sibling, someone at work, and you can have a conversation with them. And then you can say, hey, I'm just going to practice this framework. Can I identify what you're saying? And you don't even necessarily have to do that. The place that I suggest you go practice is at the market. So you're at the market, you're going through the checkout line, and you ask the person that's checking out, how are you doing today? Right? And they say, hey, um, it's been a long day. You know, I'm, I, it's been a long day and I'm tired. You know, and, and if you're going to use the NVC sheet, you're going to try to figure out what they're feeling. So maybe I would say, wow, you, you must be feeling exhausted and really excited just to get out of here. I'm guessing you need some downtime, right? So I'm identifying what they're feeling. And my guess is kind of taking a guess at what their needs are. And that might sound really, really confusing, But just practice it and pay attention to the person that you're practicing it with. You'll see a light go on, a smile. Maybe they'll continue the conversation. And that's the attunement piece. And that's what you want to accomplish with the NVC stuff. It's just a little bit of attunement. And practice it in really, really low thresholds. Grocery store, dry cleaners, ordering a soda, 7-Eleven, getting your gas, anywhere like that. It's incredibly useful and it might sound a little bit confusing. Check out the PDF. Let me know if there's any questions or comments. Join our Facebook group. Throw any comments or questions up there. The Facebook group link is in the show notes. My email is in the show notes. I'm here to support the community. Please let me know what questions you have. If there's any subjects you want me to clarify or add on or anything like that. And lastly, just to reiterate, the support group is unbelievable. There's a link in the show notes so you can join the support group. Right now, there's 14 meetings a week on Zoom, 35 to 40 people at a meeting. It's really a really, really beautiful space. And remember to share us on social media. If you have anyone else in your community that you know is struggling with stuff like this, please, please let them know about us. And there's also an opportunity to support the work that we're doing. Everything that is offered is 100% free. The only funds that we have are from donators and people like you that help support the cause and help push the conversation forward. So I'll look forward to seeing you on the next show. Happy days to all. Cheers for now.